What is up YouTube, Matt McKeever here, and today we're gonna to be exploring the eight top mistakes real estate investors make when it comes to getting mortgages or setting up their mortgages. So today, Josh and Aaron from the Finlay Mortgage Team are gonna break down for us exactly what mistakes you guys need to avoid, or hopefully you guys will tell us how to fix them if we make them as well. Real estate investing is all about having a proper setup right from day one. I mean, we know mortgages, there's things that can be locked in, there's things that you can't necessarily change, and you know, with the strategy being able to pull out that equity and um, really the entire success being a repeatable process, if you put in some sort of product that doesn't allow you to repeat or you know continue that process, you're really killing yourself moving forward. So some of these mistakes that we wanna talk about are gonna allow you to be free and, and continue to repeat that process and hopefully be successful in pulling that equity and continue to scale your profile and your, your portfolio. Yeah, you know, we have people come to us who have, you know, 10 properties, people who are looking to purchase their first, and it's usually easier to take this information if you're purchasing your first than on your 10th, because sometimes it's gonna be very costly to be able to maybe undo some of the actions you've done if you already have properties in place. So these are pretty, uh, you know, eight pretty easy things to avoid, but they're really important, and they're gonna set you up for success, as Aaron said. So let's just get right into it. Um, Low rate mortgages. I know we've beat this over the head a handful of times, but unfortunately we still see it. Clients will see a billboard and that billboard will have the absolute rock bottom lowest rate possible. Now rate is extremely important to us and finding the best product on the market is extremely important to us, especially for our clients when you're looking to you know, find a product that works best for you. But the lowest rate, probably isn't the best product, specifically because of the flexibility that it usually allows. So you might see it uh, called like a bare bones product or a rate option plus product. Um, usually these products are the lowest rates, but they have essentially no flexibility. They're usually fixed or closed terms. And sometimes they'll have something called a bona fide sale clause. And that essentially means that you can't restructure your debt unless you sell the property or wait until the end of the term. Um, so, you know, this is obviously going to become a deterrent when you're looking to restructure debt and take the equity out through either force appreciation or just natural appreciation in the market to be able to purchase your next one. So when you're looking at taking your first mortgage on your rental property, don't always get caught up in the whole lowest rate situation. Try to find a product that's gonna have the most flexibility and it's gonna work best for you because at the end of the day, that 0.1 or 0.2% on the rate is gonna be much cheaper for you in the long run than being handcuffed into a mortgage that doesn't give you any flexibility. Yeah, definitely. The second thing we want to talk about is just picking your right type of mortgage. So whether that's a fixed or a variable and what the differences are. Um, again, obviously taking a fixed, um, especially a five-year fixed mortgage is gonna handcuff you with your ability to be able to break that mortgage and effectively take out equity. Locking to a fixed rate, if you break within your first half or at least first three of those five years, you're gonna be looking at a pretty substantial interest rate differential. Um, the interest rate differential is notoriously higher than it is to break a variable rate where that variable rate is gonna have that three months interest penalty. When the whole Whole goal is to be able to repeat and move forward and pull out as much money as possible. You know, when you're paying, you know, maybe five to even 10 times the exit penalty sometimes, um, fixed versus variable rate, um, you know, that drastically reduces the amount of equity that you're gonna have to go on to your next project. And it's really gonna reduce your ability to repeat. You know, maybe you're gonna have to take an extra six months and save up. Again, being able to execute as fast as possible and as efficiently as possible is really the name of the game. And taking a fixed rate at the wrong time can really dampen your proce uh, process moving forwards. It completely, and if you, really, really want a fixed rate, there is understanding the difference between taking maybe a big five bank fixed rate and a monoline fixed rate because monoline fixed rates actually have a lower interest rate differential than some you know, large big five banks. So if you really felt inclined to take a fixed rate mortgage and maybe taking a shorter term to align with your investment strategy or understanding the difference between a monoline lender's IRD penalty versus a big five bank and that difference might cost you thousands of dollars in the long run, especially if you're more inclined to take a fixed rate mortgage. 
Um, third is going to be failing to make a plan. So an investment strategy is the most important thing that you could possibly have. Don't buy a house and then be like, okay, I got to figure this out because you know, odds are maybe the asset that you purchased isn't necessarily going to allow you to scale properly, isn't going to be allow you to be able to you know, pull capital out isn't going to align with your investment strategy you know, understanding do you want to take on capital appreciation so do you want to just buy as many properties as possible and try to take on these seven six percent appreciation annually in those assets to create wealth faster or are you looking for more of a cash flow perspective do you want to buy multifamily property that has you know recurring cash flow so you can you know quit your job eventually you know, understanding the different asset classes the type of financing that's available and the hurdles to get through those financing is going to be super important before before you even start purchasing. We saw we see a lot of clients come to us who just buy property be, for the sake of buying property. It's like I'm an investor now. Mm-hmm. Well, great, you own a place in Thunder Bay, that's awesome. But like, you know, what is that gonna do for you? What's your strategy? It's mm-hmm. like, do you wanna scale up there in Thunder Bay? Like, you know, understanding do I need to have a property manager? The total cost of it. There's so many things that go into purchasing assets and just understanding your strategy. So dial that in before you purchase your property. It's going to go a long way. Yeah, and even just what type of financing are you going to qualify for? You know, just buying a property and assuming that you have an income coming in, it's going to get you an A type financing. Um, you know, there's lender or borrowers who get the wrong advice from people. They haven't necessarily gone through some sort of pre-approval. They can get necessarily pre-approved for a rental, but at least have an idea what your affordability is, if you're going to be in the A or the B, um, or, you know, what type of shape is the property. And if it's not in great shape and you're expecting A financing and you're going to get stuck in a private, you know, that's a substantial amount of upfront cost that you weren't necessarily going to have to have on the A side and may not have budgeted for. So, I mean, that right there could potentially, you know, put you back a few months in your whole process as well, too, if that eats up any of your renovation costs so taking a look and just speaking to someone beforehand before getting started um, number four is purchasing rentals in your personal name um, you know loading up your personal name with properties does inhibit your ability to potentially move forward um, you know there are some pros and cons to really buying in your personal name but the main part of the game for investors is you know building up as large a portfolio as possible and being able to replicate that process building as much you know passive income and obviously passive growth in the equity um, buying properties in the personal name does limit your ability um, you know to continuously scale especially if you haven't bought a personal residence yet too um, the last thing you really want to do is you know buy five rental properties and then you you know, I want to buy a home and you know now you can't because you can't afford it or you know you have too many properties in your name and they're not going to allow you to buy that you know, buy your home. Um, taking advantage of a holding company and being able to shelter your personal name. Um, you know, I would obviously talk to a, a lawyer and an accountant as well too, and just understand, um, you know, all three sides of that triangle. But the ability to shelter your name and buying those properties in a holding company is going to really free up your personal name uh, for down the road. Um, you know, buying that personal residence, buying that home, your dream home that you really want to get into. Um, you know, there's options to be able to buy in holding companies uh, whether that's commercial whether that's the B side you know like we've talked about before uh, buying rentals in the commercial space under a holding company you know there isn't a limit on how many properties you can have so you know you can continuously scale without having to take up the space in your personal name and that reverts back to your investing strategy again you know understanding your strategy will allow you to be able to you know structure whether it's gonna you're gonna be buying these rentals in your personal name or in a corporation um there as Aaron said though there are some challenges in regards to you know what you can and can't buy in a corporation, but understanding your options is the most important thing. Another, you know, challenge that most investors and new investors make is underestimating the total expense to close a transaction, mm-hmm. both residentially and per, and commercially. So residentially, um, if you're closing it with an A lender, you usually just have your lawyer fees. Your lawyer fees are roughly you know fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars, depending on the type of transaction. You might have uh, an appraisal cost, you know, five or six hundred bucks, as well as maybe some tax on your mortgage insurance premium, which you might have to pay. Uh, If you are using an alternative lender, you might have some broker fees and lender fees. Most conventional lenders require probably about one and a half percent of the loan amount. They want you to show that to be able to reflect that you can actually close on the transaction. Most investors who are purchasing residential real estate don't usually have an issue with coming up with the one and a half percent. Now, when it comes to transitioning into commercial real estate, it can be a huge 
shock to some people on the cost of due diligence, what's required. You know, you might be five, six thousand dollars into a property in the due diligence phase before you even go firm on a deal. Just to be able to make an, a decision and an informed decision, you know, you have to get an appraisal. That appraisal usually costs a few thousand dollars depending on the size of the building, a building condition report, a phase one environmental, possibly a phase two. You know, phase two can run between twelve to fifteen thousand um, dollars. All of these things are required to be able to go firm on a deal especially you know understanding these larger purchases so you know if you if your strategy is to purchase residential understand your total cost if there's any broker fees or lender fees involved um, if you are looking at commercial financing understanding the due diligence costs involved in doing something like that and the total um, cost to a broker and lender to get that financing set up because sometimes it can be way more than what people would initially expect Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's a great segue actually into our next point is just not doing your due diligence before you actually go firm on a purchase. Um, like Josh just mentioned, there's a lot of unexpected costs that can come up depending on the property. Um, you know, residential properties can have environmental issues just like commercial properties can. So don't just assume that you're not going to have any environmental issues. You know, if you're near tracks, I mean, I, I think we did a video about this the last time, but you know, tracks, uh, laundry mats, any sort of like mechanical shop, gas station, stuff like that. Um, you know, can can definitely have issues. The state of your property can have issues. Again, if you know you're buying a private sale, there's no MLS. Um, show us the pictures. Let us take a look. We'll have you know decent insight as to whether or not we think this is going to be able to get done with a conventional or whether this is going to get done with a uh, private lender just based off the pictures. But again, what type of financing do you have? Are you borrowing your entire down payment or expecting to get you know A or B financing and you know those funds are being borrowed just from an investor? You know now you're taking a look at a private uh, some sort of private. Person. Purchase. So, um, you know, doing your due diligence, what can you afford? What type of financing are you going to be at? Um, you know, if your business for self, are there ways to be able to make the financing work more in favor to you? So, just having a, an upfront conversation with us, let's run some numbers and let's give you a, a better direction as to where you should be going and not just going out and putting blind offers in on, on properties. Another newbie mistake is not taking care of your personal debt. So, if you are a real estate investor and you're looking to take on, you know, an investment, a duplex, single family home, but you have a giant car payment or you have unsecured lines of credit or giant credit card balances, this can hinder your ability to be able to purchase residential real estate. Um, it may also hinder your ability to purchase commercial real estate. It's just not specifically you know, calculated based off of your GDS, TDS. But uh, you know, we see a lot of people who want to purchase real estate but don't have their finances in order. Um, you know, it's, it's great that you take the initiative and you understand the ability to be able to create wealth and how to get out of your current situation. But taking care of your finances is going to put you in a situation to be able to purchase that next property with the optimal financing. Mm -hmm. um, so just taking care of your finances, understand your credit, keep an eye on your credit, keep an eye on your balances on your lines of credit and your credit cards, make sure you're making your payments on time. But set yourself up for success before you know jumping into purchasing a property. Um, you know, purchasing a property is a great way to be able to get out of the the debt race that most people are in, you know, using refi funds to pay off all your debt. You know, we see a lot of people utilizing this strategy, but if you're absolutely maxed on your debt, it's gonna be extremely challenging for you to be able to make that next step. So if you're looking to change your spending habits or change the way you know your finances are, that's great, but you have to do a little bit of legwork first to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things too, just to touch on, especially with the cars, is understanding how things aff affect your debt is, um, a lot of things that I see too are company purchase vehicles, which are, you know, it's in my company, but it's been personally guaranteed by the borrower and it shows up in the bureau and, you know, now you're servicing another $1,400 in debt, you know, depending on what type of car, you know, if you went and bought that, you know, high-end Mercedes or BMW in your company, but you personally guaranteed it, that's gonna be on your personal bureau, you're gonna have to debt service that. If you those company trucks trucks don't have a cheap monthly payment again if you had to personal debt service that it or personally guarantee that uh, car loan it's going to be on your personal bureau it's going to be you know having to be debt serviced on your personal name so just making sure you have those conversations and be upfront and uh, i know a lot of people don't want their credit bureaus checked when we do that initial um numbers but you know if you have that and you know you don't disclose that to us the 1400 bucks can kill a deal pretty quickly so 
uh, which is a great point for number eight, uh, just not working with a mortgage broker. So, you know, working with a mortgage broker, we understand how, you know, we understand all the little nuances, all the little due diligences that you should be taking into consideration that some people don't. And it's uh, not to, you know, anybody's particular fault. It's just when you're not dealing with the lenders every day, you don't really know all the little things that they're going to take a look at, such as company vehicles that you might have personally guaranteed or, um, you know, for parents who have children, school debt, uh, lines of credits, car loans that you might have co-signed on, not thinking about that moving forward. You know, all of a sudden you got a car loan, a student loan, and, um, maybe you co-signed on their house. Now you're trying to get into the rental space, but you just have three extra lines of liability that we're gonna have to debt service before moving forward. So um, just working with someone who understands the ins and outs, the strategies to be able to get you into tougher to finance circumstances. Um, you know, we always kind of say there isn't really a deal that we couldn't necessarily get done, but there's a cost to some of that stuff. So you know, there's always an option to be able to get something done. Um, it's just whether or not the, that deal makes sense at those numbers and whether those end game numbers make sense for you. Um, Private solutions are always there. Can you get out of it? Yes, no. I mean, that's that's a, a really big, uh, a really important factor to take into consideration. But there's always some sort of solution to be able to make something work. Let's just do the numbers work. Awesome. Well, really appreciate you guys breaking down for us eight of the common mistakes that most real estate investors are likely going to make or be tempted to make at some point in time. Now, YouTube, you guys have no excuses, so you shouldn't be making those mistakes. But if you think maybe you're in the process of making the mistake, maybe you have, or maybe you just want to make sure that there's no chance you do, I really encourage you to reach out to Josh or Aaron. All their contact information is in the video description down below. So again, so important that you guys are working with local experts that actually understand what it is you're trying to accomplish or achieve because you know there's a lot of different financing solutions out there but those financing solutions could really cost you your future your ability to scale your ability to really accomplish what it is you set out to do because odds are your overall goal isn't just to buy this one deal or just to close on this one deal you probably have an entire portfolio you're trying to build and josh and aaron are the guys to help you do that and finance those deals